Je suis très heureux d'être de retour à cette merveilleuse ville, la belle Paris. Malheureusement, mes compétents en langue française sont très pauvres. En conséquence, je préfère parler en anglais. S'il vous plaît, pardonnez-moi. My topic is technology and inequality or I should say accelerating technology and increasing inequality. I believe that there are radical opportunities in the near future, but also radical risks. I'll be sharing some examples from my own history, working for 25 years in the field of technology, seeing marvelous improvements in the field of computing and smartphones. But I'll also be looking ahead at some future scenarios. I'll start with the big picture, the picture of accelerating technology. More people are learning about technology and more people are building technology. There are many positive feedback cycles and technologists are able to take advantage of each other's work, building on open source, building on wikis, building on components. And I see two strong consequences of this accelerating technology. The first is that in the next 20 to 25 years, technology will enable individual humans to be tremendously enhanced with extra intelligence, extra health, extra longevity, extra experiences, and more choice, more opportunities. But also, technology threatens to disturb humanity, as the previous speaker mentioned. There are risks to what? Terrorism, if angry, upset, alienated people have the weapons of new technology, they can do terrible things in our world. And governments with extra technology can also do bad things to us through extra spying, extra surveillance. This technology can be very valued by dictators and autocrats. Technology is also disturbing our environment. It seems it's making our climate worse. Technology is enabling robots to take away our jobs, more people will be unemployed, and more broadly, there are many existential risks from technology, which again, the previous speaker mentioned. In summary, technology stands poised to bring lots of benefits to some individual humans, but also threatens society in large ways. Some people deny this. Some people say that technology will not bring these opportunities. But I say, that's not credible. Some people say, let's stop the technology. We don't want these bad things. Let's stop this engine of improving technology. I also say, that's not possible either. There are two possible views in the big picture. One view is to say, let's concentrate on this. Let's allow individuals to enhance themselves through smart research and development and free enterprise without much interference from governments. And in this way, all these social problems will be solved as a byproduct. And that's a view which is quite common in, for example, the Singularity University. They don't deny these problems, but they think that free enterprise and more technology will solve them. But there's another view, which personally I prefer, and that is the view that as well as allowing individuals to enhance their technology themselves, as, allow, as well as supporting free enterprise, we have to be better at regulating the impact of technology on society. We need better regulation and smart governance, 
And we can say as well, as new individuals, we can have new, improved social systems, better politics. Many people who support individualism dislike politics and governments. They say politics and governments are messy and corrupt. But I say, as we redesign ourselves, we can also redesign these social systems and governments. So that's the big picture. I'm going to look at just one of the social problems. It is the social problem described by Robert Schiller, the Nobel Prize winner for econ economics, as the most important problem we are facing today. He said it is rising inequality. He didn't say the problem was inequality. He said the problem was rising inequality. And let's look at the words from one of the richest people on the planet, Warren Buffett, who is often thought to be a nice guy. He gives lots of his own money to charity and philanthropic work. But he says there has been a class warfare for the last 20 years, and his class, the rich people, have won. They have had their taxes reduced dramatically over that time. In 1992, the top 400 taxpayers earned average $40 million a year and paid 29%. That's already quite small, isn't it? But by 2010, their average income was much larger and their tax rate has come down. <coughs> there are many charts that show the same results. The rich are getting richer in real terms. The majority of the population have roughly the same salary as in 1980. The top 1% are taking home more than three times as much in real terms as they were in 1980. And even the top 20%, minus that top 1%, their salary has increased but only by about a factor of two in that period. You may have seen a chart like this before. This chart is very famous. This chart was made and famous by Thomas Piketty um, in his book, The by Capital. And he points out that if you look at the share of the income of the top 10%, over time in America, it's varied, it's been high, then for a long time it was low, but now it's climbing higher and higher again. And since his book was prepared, one of his collaborators has added extra data showing that we're now even higher than before in the next 18 months. This is by Emmanuel Saez at Berkeley. The Economist which is quite a conservative magazine. They summarized it as follows. The really, really rich are getting much, much richer. And if you look at just the top, not point, not one percent, one hundredth of one percent, they already have now 11 percent of the growth wealth of America, up to the highest it's ever, ever been previously. This is not just an American phenomenon. Piketty looked also at other Anglo-Saxon countries. The same general trends apply in the UK, Canada, and Australia, and also in many developing countries too. But what does this mean? In my remarks that follow, I'm gonna look at three questions about this phenomenon. Does it really matter? Does it really matter that some people are so much richer than everybody else if uh, everybody, in fact, is getting wealthier? If most people live today much better than in the historical times? Does it really matter? Or is it just uh, a perceived problem? The second problem I'll come to, the second question, is what is the impact of technology on this growing inequality? Is technology going to make the problem go away? Or will technology make the problem worse? For example, through these feedback cycles that I mentioned. 
I'll look at some of these feedback mechanisms in the next uh, few minutes. And I'll explore four scenarios at the end of my talk as to what's credible as regards the interaction of technology and inequality. And of course, the point is not just to talk about it, the point is to influence the future. So I will ask what can be done to avoid these risks of inequality having bad outcomes. So to the first question, is inequality really a problem? I say, yes it is. It's something that needs to concern every one of us, regardless of whether we are poor, middle class, rich, super rich, or filthy, mega rich. Each of us has to be concerned. Because a more unequal society is worse for everybody. And I'll share some uh, data about that. I also see that something that's been important in society in the past, equality of opportunity, rather than equality of outcome, that opportunity to improve, that's going away too. We call this the disappearing middle class. And worst and last, the more unequal society is more explosive, with technology making it more explosive. So onto the first of these three points, why equality is better for everybody, I'm going to share some slides from a couple of the British researchers, you can see them here, uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. They wrote, a couple of years ago, a very interesting book, The Spirit Level. Has anybody read that book here? Yes, one, two, three, four, yes. So, some of their data is as follows. That if you look at all of the richest countries in the, in the analysis, and you arrange them by income inequality, on the left, you've got countries where the income is broadly equal. On the right, you've got companies like the USA, Portugal, and the UK, where there is more inequality. And there are many of these graphs. In this one, on the vertical axis, there's an index of general issues to do with problems with health and problems with social issues. And it includes things like life expectancy, educational literacy, infant mortality, and so on. And there's a strong correlation. So if you live in a more unequal society, there are more health and social problems. If you change this axis, if you look instead at the absolute income, the richest countries here, the poorest countries here, the correlation disappears. There's only a correlation when you look at the inequality versus the health and social problems. And it's not just between countries. The two authors also look inside the USA at the figures for all the states. And the same trend emerges. States such as Louisiana, Missouri, Alabama, where there are lots of inequality, are also the ones with the highest social problems. States like New Hampshire, Vermont, Utah, Iowa, where there are fewer, uh, where there's less inequality, have less social problems. And they have lots of charts in their book. They look at the mental illness, they look at infant mortality, they look at a uh, rate of imprisonment. You're more likely to be in prison if you're in one of these countries with more inequality. And, unsurprisingly, in these countries, there is less trust <coughs> between people. People are more fearful of each other. And there is more murder in these countries. And again, if you look at the data for the different states of America, there are more murders, more homicides <coughs> in the states where there are more inequality. So if you don't want to be murdered, go and live somewhere where people are more equal. In fact, if you want a longer life expectancy, try to live in a country where there's more equality. So that's the general theory of that book. There are some critics. There's a very interesting debate 
that took place with the authors of that book and two of the critics in London's RSA, the Royal Society for Arts, which is on this video. You can get my slides later, you can look at these references. The critics say things like, just because there's a correlation, it doesn't mean there's a cause. They make many strong criticisms, but in reply, I think the authors have very strong responses. In summary, a more unequal state is a less pleasant place to be. There's more stress, and therefore there are more problems, even for the people who are well off there. But as I say, we have to look not just the equality of outcome, we have to look at the equality of opportunity. You may recognize Barack Obama and his view, the defining challenge of our time, talking to Americans, is that a basic promise that America made to the poor in society, that promise is no longer true. It jeopardizes, he says, a middle class as America basics bargain, which is that if you work hard, you have a chance to get ahead. And he says that's increasingly less true. They never promised equal outcomes, but they did hope for equal opportunity. But now it's less the case. And this has been summarized by this picture in the Technology Review magazine earlier this month, that this ladder of progress has been demolished. And if you are born into a less fortunate situation, it's much harder to do what previous generations did, which is to go and make that progress. We have a new endangered species, as well as the gorilla and the cheetah, the middle class is in danger. Because that gap in society is no longer there. And there is plenty of data looking at different salaries. The people with, lot, with good degrees, with more than a bachelor's degree, yes, their salary on the whole is rising, but even the people with just an ordinary degree, their salary in re real terms hasn't gone up since 1970s. The middle class is less well <coughs> comparably, and the poor are much less. <coughs> this isn't just true for America. America is the worst case. It's true throughout Europe as well. And so it's no wonder that Obama can say we've got diminished levels of upward mobility. A child born in the top 20% has a two in three chance of staying there or near the top but a child born into the bottom 20% has only a 1 in 20 shot of escaping over that big gap into the top. They're much more likely to stay in that state of poverty and frustration. You might expect him to say this. He is a Democrat. But let's hear from one of the richest people in America. Let's hear from uh, Nick Hanauer. You probably haven't heard of him. He was one of the first investors into Amazon. You've, yeah? Yes? He recently said there's a real problem here. The problem isn't just that we have inequality. Inequality is an essential part of modern society. But it's getting worse every day. And unless our policies change, the middle class will disappear and we'll be back to France. Back to France. <laughs> in the 18th century, before the revolution. And I'm not the expert in the French Revolution, but I don't think it was very nice, especially for the rich people. So Nick Hanauer gives this message to, he says, the fellow filthy rich, for everybody who lives in these gated bubble worlds. Wake up. It won't last. The pitchforks are coming for us. Do you know what a pitchfork is? You know, in the Simpsons they had pitchforks coming with anger, coming with weapons to do bad things to the wealthy in society. No society, he says, can sustain this kind of rising inequality. Every time in history when this inequality accumulated, eventually the pitchforks came. You'll have a police state or an uprising. <coughs> 
We're getting that a little bit. There are demonstrators in America against the Google buses. You know, Google and Twitter, they have a, their very rich employees living in San Francisco. They're being bussed down to Silicon Valley, Mountain View, in very nice buses with free Wi-Fi and uh, free games. And many people are politely demonstrating, let's stop this inequality. Some of them are not so polite. Some of them are throwing stones. They're not throwing pitchforks yet, but they're throwing stones. So Google had to hire some security guards. I want to talk more about this locking in factor. And here, I have one equation. Did you like the equations in the last talk? I think my talk is a little bit simpler. Uh, Piketty's equation, R is greater than G. He showed that in many cases now, the best way to make money is to have money and to invest it in property or something like that. And so if you have money already, it increases. I think that's my own experience. I worked hard for 25 years. I have invested my money in property, and I'm doing very well for my investments in property without working so much. So I can see this from my own case. It seems to be true. More money invests to make even more money. That's the simplest of these five virtual cycles. The second one is well known, education. Wealthy people can send their children to wealthy schools, and the people from wealthy schools go more often to good universities, get better career, and more money. That's quite a slow cycle. It lasts on generations. But what I want to talk about is faster cycles. I want to talk about what people have called the winner-takes-all scenarios, in which that if you're a little bit better, you get much, much more than the people who are second or third. Better skills are given disproportionately higher rewards. So here's my example. Instagram. Do you use the Instagram application? No. Uh, it was uh, launched in October 2010, four years ago. And within uh, 18 months, it was purchased by Facebook for $1 billion in cash and stock. How many employees did Instagram have? 300? They had 13 employees with about three software engineers. And why did Facebook pay so much money? Because this small group already had 100 million registered users. They had written a very nice, a very simple, a very usable, photo editing application which had this social network springing up around it. That's why these people who were better than the others got such a good reward. Let's compare Instagram, this camera app, with another company from the world of cameras, Kodak. Was Kodak ever valued at a billion? Well yes, Kodak's highest valuation was 30 billion but they had a lot more employees. They didn't just have 13 employees, they had 86,000 employees. If you do the mathematics, it seems that these 13 people are 2,000 times more productive. Of course, that's not true. They are a bit more productive, but they have got much, much more value. And more recently, people who have looked at this have concluded that there are already, from Instagram, seven billionaires and if you compare that with the founder of Kodak, George Eastman, each of them have got a net worth ten times greater than that founder ever had. There are other examples like WhatsApp, 55 employees, 19 billion dollars. Is this mad? Is it crazy? There is a certain logic to it. The logic that if their app is better, then it will uh, deserves to be rewarded and somehow the ones who are in this gold medal position are the ones who get much, much more than the people who are second or third. Two MIT academics, <coughs> Eric Brinjolson and Andy McAfee, have looked at this in a lot of detail. This is a very good book, The Second Machine Age. Anybody read The Second Machine Age? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the best on this whole field. They have their own analysis, which I won't go through in detail, but basically because there are more networks and standards, the best products can be used by every market. So the best product in Boston can be used by everybody in the world, rather than just being local to Boston. More and more things can be digitized, information, goods and services can be combined quickly and more easily, which explains this phenomenon. So that wealthiest do very well and the majority of people are struggling. That's the winner-takes-all scenario. But there's more. There are two more effects that might make this lock-in more dramatic even than before. And that's where technology comes into play. Technology that enhances our health. If technology can make us much stronger and fitter and more resilient, body power, we will be able to work much harder, more effectively. We'll get better rewards. But even more than technology to enhance our health, imagine that there's some new technology. A new technology at start is always very expensive. And that new technology, if it can enhance our intelligence, if there is a smart drug that actually works, if there are brain enhancements that actually work, then the people who are able to pay more for that will suddenly perhaps be 20% more intelligent, a group of people, and it can lock in even better results. So there are all these advantages. So to summarize what I've said so far, accelerating technology with its feedback looks like it can increase inequality even more than before. But other people see things differently. And I think there is another story here. And that story is that the technology is also reducing prices very remarkably. And if it's true that the prices are being reduced, as we'll see, then maybe we'll have a practical abundance. And it doesn't matter that there's inequality because everybody will get what they need. It's just that some people will have a lot more. As I heard Peter Diamandis, the co-founder of the Singularity University, say yesterday at an event uh, in Amsterdam, he said today we've got the haves and the have-nots, tomorrow we'll have the haves and the have-mores. Every will have, so the problem will go away. And it's true, prices have reduced remarkably. Let's look at some data from Mary Meeker in her annual report, which she does of internet trends. Prices are coming shooting down on computing costs. In all this time, the costs have been declining about 33% every year. So computers that cost uh, 1,000 uh, per, per million transistors, it cost about $1,000 then. It now costs only five cents to get that number of transistors. The price is reducing for storage as well, even faster, at about 38% annually. And we can see that in this picture. The best microchip storage, microcard storage in 2005, stored 128 megabytes. Whereas just nine years later, for the same price, roughly the same size, you could fit a thousand times more on 128 <coughs> so That's roughly doubling every year. So even though some people are poorer, they more easily store more things. Prices declining for bandwidth as well. We can send more information more cheaply than before. And prices are even declining for the field that I worked in for many years, for smartphones. Even though smartphones every year are getting more and more features, more and more capabilities, lots of sensors being added, lots of uh, power being added, the price is now coming down, not so fast as the other trends, but it is coming down. And the result is that now, just compared to a few years ago, in 2009, there were roughly 35 million smartphones being sold every quarter. Now in 2013, 10 times as much. And people all over the world, including comparatively poor people in these countries, <coughs> including people from comparatively poor countries, are able to benefit from this technology. The Singularity University has just released a book 
called exponential organizations, and they have lots of examples, very compelling examples of things becoming much cheaper in the last few years for same functionality. Industrial robots are 23 times cheaper over a five-year period. Brain-computer interface devices are 44 times cheaper in five years. So, if only the rich people could afford them five years ago, many more people can afford them now. Drones, 142 times cheaper in six years. 3D printing, 400 times cheaper in seven years. And the most dramatic of all, the biotech DNA sequencing that we can read our own genome is 10,000 times cheaper in seven years. So that's true. There are remarkable reductions in prices of so many things, which I've summarized on this chart, including improvements in solar energy, light sensors, and so on. And so, yes, there are these two phenomena that both exist. And that leads me to my last few words. The four future scenarios as to where this might take us. And the first scenario is that inequality is still there, but it's accepted. Because, after all, life is going to be quite pleasant even for the less well-off in society. They'll be poorer in their countries, but the goods that they want to buy will be cheaper. And they'll be relatively happy and acquiescent. And, after all, they'll be able to play video games. They'll be able to watch soap operas. This may remind you of a famous <coughs> book uh, in which people took a certain drug called Soma that uh, meant that they were quite happy and quite pleased. This is from uh, Aldous Huxley. I think he was the brother of Julian Huxley, who uh, we heard earlier. So there is that uh, vision of the future. I don't think this is going to work. This society will not work because although some things will be cheaper, there will still be some very important things that will remain expensive. So I think the second future is what I call inequality exploded. And this is the future in which there are more pitchforks and revolutions. Because although some people will watch the internet, other people will still be very angry. It's like the people from France and Britain who leave behind their education uh, and they go to fight in Syria uh, and Iraq as part of the IS. They are angry. They're doing a stupid thing, but we have to realize that they are angry despite living in relative comfort. And the point is that some technologies will still be very expensive. Technologies such as rejuvenation healthcare. Probably not everybody will, in the beginning will be able to afford the things that make us much younger and much smarter. So I do think that more likely than this happy acquiescence, there will be pitchforks. I found another picture of a pitchfork, by the way, which is uh, the kind of pitchforks that were used here in 1793. But it will be much worse, because today's angry people can have access to weapons of mass destruction. Not just YouTube videos, but also they can destroy the internet by hacking into it. Or they can make their own bioweapons. So I'm afraid of this scenario. The third scenario is that, despite this, there are certain people who enhance themselves so much, I call this transhumanism for the 1%, that they are still able to control this. Because they do what I mentioned earlier, they become super brain enhanced and super powerful, and we'll end up with a very effective police state. A bit like George Orwell, where people uh, have a bit of a enjoyment because of the drugs and because of the fact they can buy most things they need, not everything, but most things they need relatively cheaply, and then the people who want to rebel, they are controlled by these uh, super intelligent, super powerful uh, elite who can uh, keep them in place. This is a possible future. I think it's a horrible future, 
And my preference is instead of transhumanism for the 1%, my motto in life now is transhumanism for all, for the 100%. I think we have to ensure that as well as the research and development and free enterprise that will create the new technologies, we have to take many active steps to ensure that everybody will uh, benefit, not just uh, the most uh, wealthy in society. As, just as we believe we can improve on the human body, we can do a better job than evolution, Evolution has done quite a good job, but that has led to many problems. We can fix that with our new wisdom and technology. We can do the same with the social structures, the free market economy. We have to be careful in tinkering with these structures, just as we have to be careful in tinkering with our biology. But we are wise enough, we should be able to do it. So my motto, transhumanism for all. Being aware of the social issues, and making sure that the new technologies are accessible to everybody who wants them. It won't be compulsory. If people want to remain unenhanced, we must, of course, respect that choice. But everybody who wishes access will benefit. I mean transhumanism for all in another sense. I also mean that everybody should come round to this way of thinking. Transhumanism, the view that we should become uh, in control of our own evolution, that we can improve our uh, our situation with technology, that is a view I want everybody to feel comfortable with. And I think this perspective will prepare us to tackle the other social problems as well. So that's my summary. There are radical opportunities and radical risks ahead, but I think that with wisdom we can solve them, but we have to address these questions. We can't just leave them to go away, hopefully, by themselves. We need to look hard at better structures. We need to form alliances, in fact, with the movements and people who are already aware of these social pressures. We have to convince these people and these other movements that technology is their friend, if applied wisely. We have to bring them into that transhumanist perspective, but we must not lose their vision that the benefits should be for all, rather than just hoping that it's going to be a trickle-down success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, you, uh, David. So uh, we have uh, about, um, 15 minutes uh, now uh, for questions. Uh, so, Baldemar? Well, for, for David Stenford, I'll take it to the English. Uh, one issue that I see in the presentation is that inequality has never been so difficult to define. Because globalization and the digitalization has done us more able to focus on ourselves as individuals or to form new allegiances. You can fill a room of European transhumanists by communicating it through the web but it's ever more increasing to form a consensus in society, in a society of 60 million inhabitants or 500 million, like in the EU, or 7 billion. And this means that less and less solutions are able to fit into a single scheme. So isn't the problem here that we lose one part that could actually address some of the problems that you brought up in the presentation, namely experimentation, and that there will be different solutions to different problems. So, I agree. We need variety. That's how business progresses. That's how academic research progresses. There are many people who have different viewpoints, and they're allowed and encouraged to look at different solutions. But, when I say transhumanism for all, it's the broad approach that I'm hoping people will adopt. So I don't want to constrain uh, experimentation. You asked a good question. You said, what is the definition of inequality? And it's true, people will argue about how to measure it. Well, the one I'm most interested in is the equality of opportunity. That people who want to be able to take advantage of the good uh, outcomes 
of technological progress, that they should not be barred because they can't become educated or they don't have access to enough money. Now, today, of course, education is much more widely available because of technology, because of online courses. More people can learn much more than before, so that's a big help. But there are still, in practice, uh, people who feel they are locked out of opportunity, and we should make sure that that doesn't happen. Otherwise, uh, many of them will become angry and will fight against society. I can say you're not completely convinced. Uh, well, because education is the single part. Once upon a time in industrial society, can learn, people could learn how to read and write, and to do basic mathematics, and you're a functioning citizen. Today, it's not the case. Actually, you have many lines and many venues of education. And one of the problems is to how you can maximize these opportunities. And the problem is here, well, the previous speaker spoke about uh, systematic approaches. And one of the problems I see is that we don't have many ways to experiment with many of these services that are provided to us uh, as, well, income equalizers or equalizers of opportunity. I cannot see what, how healthcare functions, I cannot see how when I rate my education facilities, actually they have more opportunities to do this in the People's Republic of China than in Sweden, for instance. You can see where your physician is, how, how he's working, you can rate him, you can see how, uh, how busy he or she is, and I, I think that if you discuss these systematic acts, you will be able to have more experimentations in well, addressing issues of some forms of equality. I don't claim to have the, all the answers here. I do say that we should be focusing on looking at various social systems and seeing their advantages and disadvantages. Some countries have more uh, support for uh, uh, social uh, security. Uh, normally, I would say, look at Sweden. It's a great example. In Sweden, we have already solved this problem yes. by using a voucher system. Yes. Uh, it's so there is some experimentation on the global scale, and hopefully some other countries can uh, see that some elements of the Swedish society may apply to them as well. But then you, you start to speak about voucher systems in America, and everyone thinks that you're a freedomizer, you're liberal. <laughs> Yes. Yes. And then another question, given the fact that we are now on a trend that puts us in your third scenario in inequality control, uh, because the fact that Google and, and GAFA in general and uh, market forces control most of the uh, technology, um, what, what's the likeliness that your fourth, I mean, can you pick, put figures? on the probability of each of your four scenarios, and isn't the third one the most probable? Well, <laughs> you point out Google is taking more uh, control in, in practice. I actually have a lot of respect for the leadership of Google. They don't want this outcome. They would much rather uh, see the benefits apply to everybody, so they are not consciously aiming in that direction. But it may still happen without their conscious choice. The forces of the market may, may lead them in that direction. And the government are weaker and weaker. <laughs> yes. Uh, Especially in America, the government system is broken because of too much influence of the government, uh, finance. The, the politicians have to spend so much time raising funds and they have to spend make so many uh, promises to the, the funders. So there are problems here. Uh, what's likely to happen? The, the various scenarios. Uh, I haven't put probabilities. Maybe we should think about that afterwards. Does anybody else have strong views on these uh, scenarios? If you think one is much more likely than another, or have I missed a scenario out completely that should be included? James. Well, I think we'll probably end up with some combination of all four. That's the way that the future usually pans out. But I, I have uh, a question about your last comment. Um, Part of the difficulty that we face is that the social democratic model of trade unions, social democratic parties based on trade union strength <coughs> has been eroded by the technological changes that are working 
place, and the and the erosion of the mill class, etc. Um, you see new forms of countervailing political organization that could take the place of the old social democratic model emerging out of the new communication technology. I, I don't see them yet. I mean, Twitter and Facebook just don't seem to take the place. I think this is one of the great challenges of our time. How do we go beyond uh, a chatter uh, and uh, an idle discussion on the internet to forming uh, real pressure groups? Uh, there is uh, a group called Avias, A-V-A-A-Z, that do online campaigns, uh, certainly in Britain. They've actually had some success recently by getting enough people to vote in favour of a particular party, to sign in favour of a petition to make the UK government change its decision on a small matter, whether some particular person should be allowed into the country. So I think we're seeing the very beginnings of new social structures form, uh, but we need a whole lot more work. Uh, Anders Sandberg has actually written on this topic on improved uh, governments. Uh, systems, and not necessarily improved government governments, but improved systems for making decisions and uh, for people going beyond chatter to outcomes. Maybe Anders will talk about that in his talk. Uh, if people want it, I'm happy to add it. <laughs> but it's an ongoing project that deserves a lot more of our collective attention. <clears throat> question donc voilà fort donc on va commencer l'interrogation que nous proposer David Blues à l'instant par rapport à la probabilité des quatre scénarios oui um there is a point i think you didn't address in your four plus solution um, it's a classical objection uh, it's the fact that um, if, if you have a lot of transhumanists, the more you have people accessing transhumanist technologies, the more competition it's going to be. And so if it's transhumanism for all, I'm not sure that inequality is going to be vanquished because it's going to be uh, a race competition, a never-ending race competition. So what, what, what would you say? against this kind of objection, or did you include this objection in your You're right, there's a whole angle I, I didn't cover, and that's the angle of changing people's motivation. So as we become more enhanced, we shouldn't just become smarter, we should have more of our collaborative our instincts, our empathy instincts, our kindness instincts, our instincts for social solidarity, that should be enhanced too. So that we are more able to stand up to the pressures for everybody to compete in a nasty way against each other. So the society we live in is emphasizing often you have to compete with each other. If you don't work hard and push the others down, you won't succeed. But we also have instincts for uh, social solidarity and hopefully the transhumanist agenda will raise that. So we won't just be very smart, we'll also be very kind. And that may take away some of the worst aspects of competition and inequality. There will still be inequality of outcome, but we will all be concerned to ensure that everybody has a chance to participate in this new world. And the aspects of cold-heartedness will hopefully be diminished. Our last question, uh, and uh, we will have um, uh, for, for meal because uh, we have to uh, start again at half an hour. So, uh, last question. Please. L'accès <coughs> facilité aux technologies, L'accès facilité est possible aux nouvelles technologies ne change rien au fait que les gens n'aient pas de travail. Ah, so we need a solution for employment, yes. And that, that solution, I think, should involve some kind of a basic income guarantee. That as people have less jobs, they will work a smaller number of hours, 35 in France already, but then less, 25 and then 10, and we will have the money 
from the whole society available, uh, generated from the abundance of technologies. That needs to be a part of the solution too. I think James may talk about that when he speaks. Good question. Thank you very much, uh, David.